And here we go. Okay, here we go with the branding. This is a Touchstone Publishers presentation, your trusted source of leadership knowledge. Good morning, once again, everybody. You know, just like in the introduction, we've got a great guest. Mr. Tucker is here to gonna really help us answer some of these problems that we face as leaders all around. Good morning, Terry. Thank you for joining us. Glenn, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Yeah, it's going to, we have some great information that I think a lot of people want to dig into, but I have my traditional first question for you, and that's going to be simply this. What is it that we do not know about you or your organization that we should know about? What is it that we don't know about that we should know about? Either you or your organization or family. I don't know. I was lucky enough my senior year in college to play college basketball against North Carolina and Michael Jordan. Okay. It was Jordan's freshman year. It was 1982. North Carolina won the national championship that year. And then the following night, it was a doubleheader. We got to play against Jim Balvano and North Carolina State's team, who the following year in 1983 they won the national championship. So I was fortunate enough to play against two national championship teams during my senior year in college. So that's something that most people don't know about me. And I find that interesting. And that's actually, in hindsight, what did you notice about the coaching from a leadership business perspective, the head coaches on both sides? I mean, yeah, I played for a man by the name of Les Robinson. And as far as I know, this is still true. Les Robinson is the only individual who was a Division I basketball coach and an athletic director at three different schools. So he wow. was he was the coach and athletic director at the Citadel, where I played, the coach and athletic director at East Tennessee State University. Mm-hmm. And eventually, when Jim Valvano got into a little bit of trouble at North Carolina State, Les took over as the, as the basketball coach at NC State and also was the athletic director. So as far as I know, he's the only person who's ever who's ever done that. And just a super guy, a guy who cared about his players, cared about yeah. the fact yeah. that it was more than just basketball. I think he was one of those individuals that cared more about what we did outside of basketball and after basketball than really the four years that we spent with him. And still a, still an active individual, still involved. It goes to all the Citadel basketball games down in Charleston. On the other side of the coin with Dean Smith, Dean Smith was known for his what was called four corners offense. Um, yeah. I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but when I played college basketball, there was no three-point no line. <laughs> yeah. And there was no shot clock. And Dean Smith was famous for pulling out the ball when he got a lead and, and working the clock. And that... But his players loved him, and he was incredibly well-respected. He was a very well-respected coach, both from his players' perspective and from the coaches that coached against him in that. So Mm. I think they were both leaders in their own way. Obviously, I knew Les a whole lot more than I knew Dean Smith, but two incredibly gifted individuals that gave of themselves to their players. Quick side note, then I'm going to jump into my very first question I had for you. Have you noticed how even these coaches who are successful have gotten this emotional intelligence thing down pretty much? I mean, even some of the not so successful ones, they have a way of tapping certain parts of emotional intelligence that really help them motivate and meet the trips. Have you noticed that? I really have. I was lucky enough to be recruited by Mike Krzyzewski, Coach yeah. K, yeah. when he was an Army. And he yeah. actually came to my house and sat on our couch and said, hey, come play for me at West Point. And I'd had three knee surgeries. I just wasn't sure my knee was up to the military side of that. So I turned him down. But a funny story, 20 years later or so, I was living in Cincinnati. I was a policeman. I was working nights. And North or Duke was playing Connecticut for the national championship. So I recorded it because I was working that night. And the next night I went down and our daughter was, I don't know, three maybe, and watched the game. And Duke lost to Connecticut. And at the end, there's an embrace, a hug between William Avery and Coach K. And for the next two weeks after that, my daughter would say every night after dinner, hey, Dad, let's go watch the, let's go watch the hug. And I was like, the hug? What are you talking about? No. You know, it wasn't, the, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't the game that motivated her or that she resonated with. It was the hug between Coach K and Avery. So I sat down and I wrote Coach K a note. I said, hey, you probably don't remember me. It's been 20 years. But here's an experience that happened with my daughter. And 
I got a letter back from a handwritten letter back from him about two weeks later, basically saying, thanks for telling me this. Thanks for sharing it. I get close to my players. It was a tough loss for us and stuff like that. That's class. That's he didn't have to do that. I didn't even play for him. I, I said no to him, but that's what class looks like. That's what somebody who's emotionally intelligent progresses or, or looks like. It's reaching out. It's developing relationships with people that you don't need to, but you want to. You have that emotional intelligence and you want to have that connection, even with a player that ended up not playing for you. See, that's a powerful story. That's a powerful story. And the connection that you and your daughter put together from that's powerful and the connection that Coach K came back with it on. I want to ask you something that's a little bit difficult, and I'm just going to get out the way just through my own health struggles, but can you tell me a little bit more, tell us about how your 10-year battle with cancer affected your journey and how it influenced your coaching philosophy and life philosophy? Absolutely. I'll give you a little bit of background on, on my cancer journey. 2012, I was a girls' high school basketball coach in Texas, and I had callus break open on the bottom of my foot, right below my third toe. And initially didn't think much of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. But after a couple of weeks mm-hmm. of it not healing, I made an appointment and went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. Okay. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. But he sent it off to pathology to have it looked at. And then two weeks later, I received a call from him. And as I mentioned, he was a friend of mine. And the more difficulty he was having explaining to me what was going on, the more frightened no, no. I was becoming. Until he, yeah. he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have an incredibly rare form of melanoma. And most of us mm. think of melanoma as the skin exposure yeah. or sun exposure, and it affects the yeah. melon, the pigment in our skin. He said, this has nothing to do with that. This is a rare form that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And because of that, he recommended I go to MD Anderson Cancer Center. So I had a surgery to remove the tumor on the bottom of my foot, had a surgery to remove all the lymph nodes in my groin. And at the time, melanoma was pretty much a death sentence. They did not have really anything to deal with it. So my oncologist put me on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon, just to try to keep the cancer from coming back. The side effects of the interferon were that I had severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days every week after each injection. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And as I said, as my oncologist used to tell me, Terry, we're just trying to kick the can down the road and buy you more time. Five years of interferon became so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees, which is usually not compatible with being alive. Yeah. Somehow I survived that, but I had to stop the interferon and almost immediately the cancer came back in the exact same area on my foot. That was 2017. 2018 had my left foot amputated. The cancer worked its way up my leg into my shin in 2019 requiring two more surgeries. And then in 2020, an undiagnosed tumor, kind of in my ankle area, for lack of a better word for it, grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. And my only recourse right in the middle of the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated. And I also found out I had tumors in my lungs and I'm still being treated for those tumors. And Glenn, I know this sounds like a very dark and ugly journey, and it certainly has been, but I'll tell you, I've learned several things during this. One of which is I don't really think you know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity. And secondly, I think cancer has made me a better individual. I gathered that from just going through the things I was, I think I told you before we did this, I study. And just going through that, it touched me in so many ways because you don't realize what you can be until you get tested. Every major setback, if you will, and now I'm of the frame of mind, I think that your story tells it. You may call it a setback, that's just because you don't know what good it's going to do for you down the road. And you did that, and I realized that it could be a dark story, but it had a positive influence 
on your career, didn't it? Yeah, and it's had a positive influence on other people. I'll give you a story. When I'm treated every three weeks at the University of Colorado Hospitals for the tumors that I have in my lungs. And when I first started, I've been doing this for two and a half years now. When I first started in the infusion unit, there was a nurse there. And she was already a nurse. She's about 25 years old. But she was learning how things were done on the unit. And about eight months later, she was taking care of me by herself. And she came in and she said, Terry, I've got this story I want to tell you, but I'm a little uncomfortable telling it to you. And hmm. I, I, honestly, Glenn, I didn't know how to respond to that. You know, like, it was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I hope you find up the courage to tell me. It sounds like I would enjoy the story. So she's in and out for the next couple hours doing her thing. And finally she comes in and she sits down on the bed. And she said, all right, here's the story. She said, when I first met you, I was going to get out of nursing. I had a good friend of mine that had died. I was in a really dark place. I was going to get out of nursing. I talked to my parents and I was going to go to work for Amazon. And she said, then I met you and I see all the struggles. I see the difficulty that you experience with your treatments every day. And I went back in the files and I read your story over these last 10, almost 11 years now. And she said, after doing that, I knew I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Now, if she would have never told me that story, I would have had no idea that my life had a positive impact on her. So I always tell people, okay. you have no idea, regardless of the struggles that you're experiencing in your life, you have no idea how people are looking at you and saying, gee, I would give everything I have just to walk five minutes in your shoes. So regardless of how, oh my gosh, I'm not productive, I'm not doing anything with my life, it's other people are looking at you and seeing just how incredibly amazing you really are. So you have no idea how many people's lives you're impacting that you have no idea who those people are. I conclude, use that almost statement at the conclusion of some of my keynotes in this area. But I'll share this with you. When I was going through all this information about you, I said, there's a gentleman right here who knows how to make an impact on people. And I started wondering, was that based upon, because you, you have a diverse career, right? D1 basketball player, great athlete, coaching, law enforcement. How do these things, how do you incorporate that into your actual coaching? Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned from being part of a team, from playing team sports, and for me, it was team sports. I think whatever team you're on, whether it's the team at work, your family dynamic, people at church, whatever that ends up being, whoever your team is, what I learned from team sports is the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You, At least I realized on a team that if I don't do my job, not only do I let myself down, but I let my teammates down, my coaches down, my fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. And I am on a, a clinical trial drug now that I go to the hospital for a week every three weeks. I've been doing this for two and a half years. I get this drug that's infused into me. I have terrible side effects afterwards. I shake violently. I throw up. I have a headache. I have a fever, et cetera. And Glenn, the drug is probably not going to save my life, but it may save mm. the life of somebody five years from now, 10 years from now, who I'll never meet based on the data that the doctors are gleaning from my blood tests and my scans and things like that. And the way I look at that is going back to what it was like to be part of a team. That's being part of something that's bigger than yourself. And I think down deep, we all feel that way. We all want to be part of something that's bigger than us, something that makes us feel like I have a purpose, I have a passion, I have a why in life, and that's something that's bigger than me. And so for me, that was one of the biggest things that I've learned. And I try to I try to teach people that. I try to get people to, to look behind, to look yeah. beyond what they're doing right now and say, what is that thing or things in your life that is bigger than you? And so that's one of the big things that I try to get people to do at this point in my life. I find that because just the example you set for the nurse helped her find, I think you refer to it as the extraordinary life. Here's your passion, your power. Just the example you said, when you're actually doing this, how do you do it? How do you help individuals identify what they're passionate about, what their bigger 
purpose and what they are living, how they connect with that team. How do you do that? Yeah, that that's a great question. I, I think back on uh, Victor Frankel was a concentration camp survivor. Uh, eventually became a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Wrote all kinds of books about man's search for meaning and things like that. Yeah. And he talks about the importance of us finding our purpose. That we're just not put here to just hang around for a while and then die. That we all have a purpose in life. And it's important that we find that purpose. It's important that we find it and we live it. And so people ask a similar question to what you just asked me. And what I tell people is we all have unique gifts and talents. You may be better at something than I am. Maybe you're better at writing and reading. I'm better at math, although I know I'm not better at math. I'm, I'll tell you that right now. But It'd have to be pretty bad for me to be better. But you have unique gifts and talents, and I have unique gifts and talents. And I, I always tell people, find out what those unique gifts and talents are. Find out what interests you. Find out what your passion is, things that you enjoy doing, and then try to turn that into your purpose. I, and that's the other thing. We all think that I've got to find my purpose in life. And yes, you do. But I have found in my life that I've had purposes, plural. When I was young, it was athletics. I, I felt that my purpose was to be an athlete. And then as I transitioned into adulthood, it was more to be in law enforcement and to try to make a difference in my community as a police officer or things that I did there. And now, as I'm probably coming to the end of my life, I feel my purpose is to put as much goodness, positivity, motivation, love back into the world as I possibly can. So I think a lot of times people feel like my, my purpose has to be my job. It has to be my occupation. If yeah. it does, that's great. If you can align those two things, absolutely, that's super. But it doesn't have to be that way. Your job could be over here. It's what you do to pay the bills. But your purpose is to be a podcast host or be a writer or an activist or whatever it is that you feel is in your heart. And, and I always tell this, especially to younger people. If there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things that you're going to regret are not going to be the things that you did. They're going to be the things you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to go back and do them. So I guess I encourage people to find their unique gifts and talents and then try to use those in an effort to find their purpose. And That's a challenge and it's scary. I know when I talk to people and I ask them what their passion is, most of the time, 80 to 90% of the time, the passion, they align it with the work, what they're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, I just don't believe that. And I kind of tell them, I said, I don't believe that you, your passion is to be the best mail delivery person in the world, delivering mail all the time and getting to work on them. What is your true passion? And I realize you can't get that answer out of people unless they trust you. But do you have any other tips or clues that might help a coach who's listening right now to get that employee to give their true? It's funny. I was listening to a podcast over the weekend and the individual was saying, don't follow your passion. Just bring it with you wherever you go. And I thought that was it, it's your passion is one thing, but your purpose, I think, is different. We all have passions for and bring those passions with you. Whatever you do, give it 100%. We're taught that as athletes and things like that. You always want to give your best. You always want to do that. But what does that look like? How do you know you're giving your best? I, I wrote a book called Sustainable Excellence, and people always ask me, what is excellence? Then I always say mm -hmm. to them, I, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean you don't know? You, you wrote a book with that title. How can you not know what excellence is? And what I say to them is, you and I may look at a team, we may look at a company, we may look at something, and you may say, I think that team is excellent or that company is excellent. And I may look at them and say, eh, I think they're good, but I'm not sure they're excellent. And I always feel like excellence, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. You have to define excellence for yourself. It's not something that I can say, Glenn, here's your definition of excellence. You, Glenn, have to define that. I, Terry, have to define how I view excellence, whether it's in work capacity, or whether it's in my family, whether it's in my church, whether it's a team I'm coaching or something like that. We have to define that. And I think the way you do that is you start by defining your values. And I think that's where people go wrong a lot of times, where we have New Year's resolutions mm -hmm. or we have goals that we set. 
And why do most yeah. New Year's resolutions go by the wayside by the first couple of weeks in February? I think it's because a lot of those goals and resolutions aren't tied to our values. But what do we value? We value family. We value truth. We value character. We value humility. What is that thing that no matter what happens to you in life, it's not going to waver. It's not. It's unshakable. It's unmovable. And you have to define that for yourself. What are you willing to yeah. give your life for with the understanding that you may never be successful in life at that thing? I think a lot about the doctors and the researchers who gave their life to the research of the drug that I'm on now that never had quote unquote success, never found, never got to the point that, that where this drug had been developed, but their research led other doctors and other researchers to the point where they could use the data that those previous doctors and researchers had used and now have developed this drug that for the last two and a half years has kept me stable. I still have the tumors, but they haven't gotten bigger and they haven't gone anywhere. Was your life a failure? No, I think your life was an absolute success, even though other people may not look at your research and say they, they didn't come up with that drug. No, but their data, their research led other doctors, other people to, to forward, to move forward yeah. with that research and come to the drug that has now helped me live another two and a half years. I marvel at what you're saying there for quite a bit. It's taken me off. The question I want to ask you, because now you bring up this thought of okay, your values. What do you value? And the things that you value, but I'm wondering, as you're saying that, how many of us have values that we know? Values yeah, that we you're create. absolutely right. Yeah. I think a lot of us will cash in our values for the money. Yeah. I don't say us, because I don't think I'm in, you and I are in that, and people I, are in that I know, we don't cash it in for our money. I don't know, though. No, so you're right. You're right. That's, I think it's so important for people to understand that. What What is so unshakable in your life? Is it faith? Is it family? Is it character? Is it humility? I mean, there's a million. Is it trust? I think back on, on the books I've read and the podcasts I've seen on Coach K, who talks about we value trust, even with LeBron James and Kobe Bryant and Magic Johnson and those people. We, you know what? I'm going to look you in the eye and we're going to be honest with each other. And I remember I was doing a master class that Coach K did, and he talked about a story that, it, that happened when he was coaching the NBA players and they were going, they, they were the Olympic team. And he said, we were getting ready to leave. I don't remember what, which one, which Olympics it was from. He said, but we were getting ready to leave to go over to the Olympics. And we finished a basketball game, an exhibition game. And Kobe Bryant had taken all kinds of terrible shots. And LeBron came to Coach K afterwards and he's, yeah, that, that's not going to cut it. He's taking terrible shots. And Coach K said, right before the bus was going to leave the next day, he said, I pulled Kobe into the office and I said, hey, those shots you took yesterday. No, they're not. They're not good shots. They're not t shots that our team wants to take. I don't want you taking those shots. He said, mm -hmm. Kobe looked at me and he said, is that it? And Coach K said, yeah, that's it. And Kobe said, you're absolutely right. Those were terrible shots. I will never take them again. Thanks for letting me go or thanks for telling me. Now let's get on the bus and go play basketball in the Olympics. So it's being honest with a, an unbelievably great player. Kobe Bryant, unbelievably great player. But it's a coach saying, you know what? I respect you enough and I have a value that honesty is that important to me that I'm willing to look you in the eye and say, you know what? I don't care how great you are. Those were bad shots and you shouldn't take those. And the other flip side of that is that Kobe Bryant was in, available for the feedback. Absolutely. Yes. He was coachable, as you and I would as say. You was, yeah. 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 He was coachable. He's coachable. He's willing to take feedback from other people and say, hey, I don't know everything. I'm not always right, but give me some feedback. I'll digest that. I'll think about that. And in that instance with Coach K, it was absolutely right out of the gate. You're right, Coach. I was wrong. I should not have taken those shots. I will not take them again. That's being coachable. Yeah, because you know what? As you were telling the story, I could almost see, because my viewpoint of Kobe Bryant is not the, I don't know. I don't know. But I can almost see him being a supersized. I said, oh, I'll take him because I'll make him eventually. Yeah. And But he said, okay, if it's hurting the team. So there's also being honest, but being 
trusting each other in the team play. And I think that happens a lot in team sports. You got to trust the man right next to you or trust the woman right next to you. You got to trust them. And you do. You, but you that trust is earned, right? as you and I know. That that's Trust is earned. It's not yeah. a right. You have to show me that you deserve to be here. You, what's your work ethic? What's your, and on teams like, I'm sure the Lakers and on Duke and things like that, high performing teams, it's not the coach that relays that message. It's the upperclassmen. It's the seasoned veterans on the team. Mm. It's like, this is the way we do things as a Laker. This is the way we do things as a Duke Blue Devil. This, this is the way things are done. And that is shown by the upperclassmen. And now you're going to show me whether you understand that. Yeah. And if you do that, then you've earned my trust. And if you've earned my trust, then I feel comfortable. I was use, I use the, who do you want in a foxhole with you when the shooting starts? Is it somebody you can trust? Is it somebody you know who's going to have your back? Is it somebody you know who's not going to cut and run when things get difficult, that they're going to be there with you? That's trust. That's respect. That's humility. That's character. All those kind of rolled into one. And those are the kind of people that I want with me. And I think you and I, we're old enough that we understand that, for example, if I didn't know you, but I knew the five people that you hung around with the most, yeah, I could tell you a lot about you. What kind of person you were? What's your character like? What do you value? What do you see success as? But I don't know you at all, but I know the people you hang around with. And I always tell people, especially younger people, surround yourself with people that care about you, that love you, that support you, that wants that want the best for you, that are smarter than you, because those people will make you better as opposed to the people that you know, you're hanging around with people that always have drama, that always make life about them. Those people you want to try to distance yourself from. And I know as I've had cancer, people have come up to me and been like, oh, Terry, I, I could never do what you did. And I look at them and I say, yeah, you're right. You couldn't because in your mind, you've already decided that you would fail or you couldn't do what I did. Why would yeah. you go into something? Why would you start something with the idea that you are not going to be successful at it? It's It all starts up here. It really does. It starts there. And like I remember hearing it on a, some TV show and heard it being quoted elsewhere is that six inches six inches between your ears where it all ends and so if you're going to be president of the united states is that six inches if you're going to be whatever you want, it's going to be a six inches and when you said value when you're talking about you got to have the values first and the passion will flow if you have the values first i think you have the attitude of not giving up and if you understand what the values are, you're not going to give up so quickly. You're not going to be so locked into this idea of, I don't feel like exercising today. Right. I don't feel like doing my best today. Uh, but my value says, do my best today. So in order, I'm going to take care of that. But I noticed something that i like to spend our last few minutes together with, your four truths. When I was going through your four truths, they got me right here. So these are powerful. Would you like to share those and talk to them a little bit about them? Sure. So the fortress, I have them on a post-it note here in my office. And so I see them multiple times during the day and they get reinforced in my brain. And they're just one sentence each. And here they are. So the first one is control your mind or your mind is going to control you. The second one is embrace okay. the let, pain. Was, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I changed my mind. I was going to just get you on each of these, but I, go ahead and give them all four. Then let's go back. Okay. Number two, embrace. So number two is em embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that pain and difficulty to make you a stronger and more resilient individual. Number three, I look at as a legacy type of truth. And it's this, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. And then number four is, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I call those kind of the bedrock of my soul. They're just a they're just a good place to start, I believe, to build a quality life from. When I was reading through them, especially when we just got through the conversation, those are real powerful values. That I, if I let me take my part, and then I want to ask you how we get these inside of our businesses. But control your mind, or it will control you. What we're saying is control what you think about. Focus on how you want it to come out, right? As a, Absolutely. How do, you, how do you train that? I well, can give it great. I can tell it to you all the time, but. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I guess, let me back up. If you and I, if we took a basketball, we went out onto the basketball court, went to the free throw line, and we started to practice free throws. There would be a certain area of our brain that would engage, or if we could image it under an MRI that would light up. But the interesting thing about that is, if you think about taking that basketball, going out onto that free throw line and shooting those baskets, that exact same area in your brain will engage or would light up if we were looking at it under a CAT scan. So we all become what we think. And so I always caution people, we all talk to ourselves, whether we like to admit it or not. We all have this kind of self-talk. And I always tell people, be very careful what you say to yourself. Because if you're the kind of person who over and over says, and I'll stay with the basketball example, I'm a terrible free throw shooter. I'm never going to be any good at this. It doesn't matter how much I practice. Eventually, you're going to hardwire that part of your brain so that you are going to be a bad basketball player. The same thing if you're a student and you're taking an algebra class or a science class, whatever it is, and you're like, boy, I'm, I'm terrible at algebra. I've never been good at math. There's no way I'm going to do good in this class. You need to flip the narrative. You need to change the script and start saying positive things to yourself. We all have negative thoughts. I don't care how positive, you can be the most positive person in the world, but if understand you're gonna have negative thoughts. You need to take those thoughts and flip them into something that's more positive. And it's just Bobby Knight, the basketball coach in Indiana, when I was growing up, used to have a saying that went, mental is to physical as four is to one. So here's this great coach teaching elite athletes to be great basketball players on the court. But what he was really saying with that quote is that your mind or your mindset is four times more important than anything your physical body is going to do. If you just remember, we all become what we think. It's We know that if we eat fruits and vegetables and proteins and things like that, we're going to have a good body. Good in, good out. Same thing works with your brain. If you have good thoughts, if you're putting positive thoughts into your mind, then you're going to have positive outcomes when it comes to the things that happen to you in your life. That is so true. Even from a lot of different perspectives, we could have a whole podcast just on that number one truth. When you're talking about the basketball thing, I was thinking, you know what? I can't dunk basketball. I think I've always told myself that even though I'm a little bit short, just a little hair short of six foot two. Muggsy Bowl was a five seven. He could dunk, so I could have yeah. too. <laughs> All in mind. This idea of embracing the pain and the difficult situations. So I always think of it, and I'm asking you for your coaching here, because I always think of it to say, okay, if I can fight through this pain, I can go past. If I can go ahead and read the things, read your books, read your website, go through the different things. By the way, let me make sure I put that back up there. But get past the pain of doing the right thing. I will be better. And nature they say you can't be better than 100 percent. okay i guess i'm reading in this to say again coach me on this to say we don't know what 100 percent is for us if we embrace the pain we'll get past that is that a fair representation in my mind or would you have me twist and change it a little bit here's the way i look at this our brains are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure so to the brain, the way things are right now, the status quo, it's comfortable and familiar and should be just left alone, just leave it alone. The problem with that is the only way we're going to grow, the only way we're going to get better, the only way we're going to improve is if we step outside our comfort zones and we do things that make us uncomfortable. I do this every day of my life. I recommend it to everybody else. Do one thing every day that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that scares you, that's potentially embarrassing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But if you do those small things every day, when the big disasters in life hit us, and they hit us all, we lose somebody who's close to us, we get let go from our job, we find out we have a chronic or a terminal illness, you'll be so much more resilient to handle that pain than the people who just casually go through life. I always say that, you know, people are, People live a casual life. And as a result of that being that casual life, their dreams, their goals, their ambitions become a casualty of that unplanned living. So do something every day that makes you, somebody asked me the other day, it's like, what did you do today? I hate going to the dentist. 
But I picked up the phone and I called the dentist. And I made it. People were like, oh, that's no big deal. When you hate the dentist as much as I do, that a is big a big deal. deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, yeah, it's those little things that we do every day to take us outside our comfort zones that cause us to grow, that cause us to mature and to be better and more resilient. When nobody, when you don't challenge yourself, when you don't do anything, when those big things hit us in life, those are the people that fall apart. Those are the people we talked about. Do you want those people on your team? Do you want those people in the foxhole with you? No, I want the people who do tough things every day. And by doing those tough things, they callous themselves, they callous their brain, they callous their intuition, they callous themselves so that when big things hit, when the when the going gets tough, the tough get going kind of saying, right. I want those people who have already calloused themselves and are ready to take on the challenge, not the people who are like, oh, this is difficult. I'm going to back away and I'm not going to do that. Very few people take personal responsibility for their own success and happiness. I think that's a better way to put it because I listen to the folks out there saying, you got to take responsibility for everything that goes wrong. I don't think we can control everything goes wrong, but we can control our own successes. We, we can. can. When I was at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, it's a military school. And one year we had a president by the name of James Stockdale. And Admiral Stockdale yeah. 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 had been a prisoner of war in the Hanoi Hilton during Good the work. Vietnam War. He was shot yeah. down in his fighter. He ejected out. He spent eight years as a prisoner of war and ultimately won our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. And I didn't have a lot of interaction with him, but I remember being in an event one time where somebody asked him who survived that, that brutal torture and confinement. And he said, well, let me tell you who didn't survive. He said it wasn't the big, strong, tough guys that thought that they could handle any kind of torture or beatings. He said, because the Viet Cong got real good at torturing and beating us. He said those people did not survive. He said it wasn't even the optimist that survived. The person who thought, well, hey, we'll be released or rescued by Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter. He said because Christmas or Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter would come and go and we wouldn't be rescued and those people would die of a broken heart. He said the people that survived, survived by understanding what they could control. And he said for us, it was our breathing and our thoughts and controlled those. Everything else was at the discretion of the Viet Cong. When we ate, when we went to the bathroom, when we were tortured, when we were beaten, everything else was at their discretion. He said the people that survived understood what they could control in their lives and then controlled that. I'm going to have to change something I've been saying just based upon that. Because I, I, I think you're right. We can be happy when we control the things that make us happy. When we look at the things. I like that. I'll work on that and change. that's part of that's you're going to get credit for that a little bit but that does things <laughs> my, some of the things i say through a keynote address your third point what we leave behind is our legacy and i hadn't really thought about it if we're going to create a strong legacy is what we leave behind in other people's hearts how did you come up, across that profound thought I guess I've thought a lot about death as I'm, like I said, I'm probably coming to the end of my life. And I've thought a lot about that. And I remember back when I had my leg amputated and I found out I had these tumors in my lungs. And I went with my wife to the mortuary and to the cemetery and to the church and I planned my funeral. And because yeah. I go on podcasts like yours and I give presentations where I talk about the need to continue to move forward and to be motivated and things, I actually got some brushback from people who commented that, somehow planning my funeral was in some way defeatist. And I laughed and I looked at him like, the last time I checked, we're all going to die. Don't think anybody's working on a cure for life right now. But what I told him was, everybody's going to die, but not everybody is really going to live. And I remember hearing a Native American Blackfoot proverb years ago that I absolutely love. And it goes like this, when you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world, the world cries yeah. and you rejoice. 
Glenn, that's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. Don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to hasten my demise in any no, way. That's but, a good thought. but death is not nearly as scary for me because I believe I found my purpose in life. I use my unique gifts and talents and I live that purpose. So again, going back to what we were talking about earlier about purpose, if you do that, when you come to the end of your life, again, people are looking at you. People, You may not have to say a word to anybody, but people may look at you and say, you know what? He left an impact on my heart just by the way he lived his life. There's, a, there's an entrepreneur by the name of Ed Milet, and he talks about the four types of people in the world. He said the first type are the unmotivated. And he said, that's mm -hmm. the vast majority of people in life. He said, the second type are the motivated. Simple. If I do this, then I will get that. It's an yes, easy yeah. way to live life, but it's effective for a lot of people. And then he said, the third group are the inspirational people. Inspirational coming from two words, in spirit. You right. move people with your energy. And then the last group are the aspirational people where people want to be like you. So I've always tried to be an aspirational person. I'm not there. I don't think I, I probably will ever get there. But if you look at, it's not so much what you say, because I've gotten to the point and I'm old enough where, yeah, I don't really put a lot of stock in what you tell me. I watch what you do. do does yeah. your do your words match up with your actions? Because if we give a lot of lip service to things, but we don't follow through with it when it comes to our actions. I want to be a person of action. And if my action can aspire somebody to live a better life, that's weaving weaving into somebody's heart when I'm leaving behind. You know, that, and that's, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, okay, that would be just a powerful place to be in. But you have to be of a certain yoke in your own mind to move from inspirational to aspiring, rather people get aspired by you. I look at some of the things I've been paying attention to lately, stoicism and things of that nature. And it seems to me, and help me with this thought that's starting to percolate, we spend too much time worried about how other people view us versus how we treat them, how we help them, how we can be an aspirational type of leader. I, I totally agree with you. We spend a lot of time on things that I'm not going to say that don't matter, but that aren't nearly as important. And I'll give you a quick story. I had a nurse ask me, all my stories are like basketball and nurses. So sorry about yeah. that. But, no, not an issue. It's great stories. So go with it. So she said to me, what was it like to have your foot amputated and then to have your leg amputated? And I told her, it, it hasn't been easy. I'm still learning how to walk again. It's been almost three years. I'm six yeah. foot eight inches tall. So falling from my height, not a good thing. It's you know, not, a good thing. No. <laughs> not a good yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. But what I told her was, cancer can take all my physical faculties, but cancer can't touch my mind. It can't touch my heart and it can't touch my soul. And that's who I am. That's who you are, Glenn. That's who everybody who's listening to us is. Our heart, our mind, our soul. We spend so much time, is my hair right? Or am I wearing the right clothes? Or what do people think about me? And we don't spend, in my opinion, nearly as much time working on who we really are. And I'm not telling you not to go to the gym. I'm not telling you not to eat. I'm not telling you not to abuse alcohol and drugs. I'm not telling you any of that. You should absolutely do or not do those things. But at the same time, we need to spend more time working on who we really are. And that's our heart, our mind, and our soul. And I think a lot of the things that we're talking about now help us to develop those things. We're talking about character, talking about being an aspirational type of person, I think help us to develop those things in our lives. And if you take that to the next step, I think in a way, by developing those things, you're hoping other people will develop those things in their life. If you're leading an organization and you're that way, by your example, other people will go that way. At least while they're in yeah. the building. So yeah, I you're think absolutely that's, right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Okay. And I want to be respectful of your time here, but I want to ask no, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, sure. great, great. But as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. That yeah, I think. Go ahead. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. But I'll tell you how it resonates with. Someday my pain is going to end. A man through surgery, mm -hmm. man through some type of new medication. Quite frankly, man, when I die. 
But if I yeah. quit, if I give up, if I give in to pain, then pain will always be a part of my life. Yeah. If you give in to doing what's wrong, if what's wrong will always be part of your life. If you give in to not doing your best, not doing your best will always be part of your life. Those are harder things to do. I think oftentimes people quit because it's more comfortable not to stretch, not to put up with those things. So those are issues. So even with all four of those, as I think about it, especially number four, as long as you don't quit, if you got a horrible employee. If you don't quit on trying to get them to be better, you haven't lost. Yes, you may have to ask them to go to a different company. Because they're not suited for this company, but if you don't quit on them, you're going to win, and that's going to be good inspiration for you. Great. Real quick, not real quick, but what are you doing right now? I know that you're in the process, but what are you doing right now to help others get this message across? Books? In all workshops. honesty, it's it's nice people like you that allow me to come on to their podcast. I, as I mentioned, I spend a week in at the hospital during my treatment weeks. I don't mm -hmm. do anything. I'm too sick. But then I have two weeks off. And during those two weeks off, I go on podcasts. And I've been fortunate to be on well over 600 podcasts with people all over the world talking about this kind of thing and getting people to look at things maybe a little different way. And that's what I feel my purpose is. I remember when I had I had the tumors in my lungs and I had my leg amputated. And about eight months later, my doctor showed me my CAT scan from that time. I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT yeah. scan, but I kind of was, gee, that doesn't look like it should be there and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. But when I looked, I, I had these big tumors in my lungs. I had fluid all around the pleural spaces in my lungs. And I looked at my doctor and I said, how was I alive? And he shook his head and smiled. And he said, I have no idea because you certainly shouldn't have been. Which said to me that I've always been a very person of strong faith, that God's not done with me. When I die, how I die, when I die, way above my pay grade. I don't spend a lot of time worrying about dying. I spend more time worrying about what I can give back to people. And the way I try to explain this is this. We seem to be, we seem to feel that we're born empty. And that when we get out of high school or college or, or the army or whatever we end up doing, then when we start to get into life, that our purpose is to fill ourselves up. We're born empty. We got to fill ourselves up. We got to get a great job. We got to make a lot of money. We got to drive a nice car. We got to have a nice house. And we fill ourselves up. And Glenn, what, I've, what I've come to understand is that it's just the opposite, that we're born full. And our job is to empty ourselves out for the betterment of ourselves, our family, our friends, our community, wow. our world. Wow. And if you look at it that way, life is not nearly as hard. It's what do you have inside of you that you can give to other people? And that's what I'm trying to do with whatever time I have left. I say, wow, because that might be one of the most impactful things you said to me today personally, because what we're saying, what you're saying is in different ways, in a business sense, that 80% that I'm doing that doesn't lead to anything, empty that away empty that away and look how much better your life would be at 20 percent when i'm trying to motivate or lead people that 20 percent will do it more than that 100 percent so why do you get stressed out over that that's very powerful let me ask you another quickie it won't be a quick i don't think i hope not but it could be <laughs> <laughs> what questions should i have asked you that i didn't ask you I don't know if it's a question, but I feel uncomfortable sometimes. I come across as somebody, I think sometimes, that has the answers. And I don't feel that I do. I don't want your audience to ever think that I don't have bad days. I do. I get down. I cry. I feel sorry for myself. I have those days. But when I have those days, I think of two stories that really help me continue to move forward, to help me to get on out of this. One was an article that I read about a professor back in the 1950s at Johns Hopkins University that did a study with rats. And he took rats and he put them in a tank of water that were over their head. And he wanted to see how long the average rat could tread water. And the average rat treaded water for about 15 minutes. And just as those rats were getting ready to sink and to drown, he reached in, pulled them out, dried them off, and let them rest for a while. And then he took those exact same rats 
and put them back in that exact same tank of water. And the second time around, those rats treaded water on average for 60 hours. Think mm. about that. First time, 15 minutes. I'm just not going to fail in my business or whatever it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. My life is going to be over. The second time around, 60 hours, which said to me two things. Number one, the importance of hope in our lives. We have to believe that regardless of where we are in our life right now, at some point, maybe not this week, maybe not next month, maybe not even next year, but at some point, life will get better for us. That If we continue down this path, if we don't quit, if we don't give up, if we keep following our purpose or our passion, that we will get to where we're supposed to be. And the second thing it taught me was, I always believe that, the second thing it taught me was just how much more our physical bodies can handle than we ever thought they could. I think we all have a, a breaking point, a point where I just can't do anymore. Okay, but that breaking point is so much further down the road than we ever give ourselves credit for. We quit, we give up, we, something gets in our path, whether we're starting a business or we're a salesperson and I, I'm not reaching my goals, whatever it is, something gets in our way. And we quit, we quit too easily because we think we're done. We think we have nothing left to give, but you do because that breaking point is so much further down the road. You think you're there. You think I can't do anymore. You can't. You absolutely positively can. And the second story, and this is a little bit shorter, I have a friend of mine who's a former Navy SEAL. And the SEALs talk about their 40% rule, which basically mm -hmm. says that if you're done, if you're at the end of your rope, if you can't go on, you're only at 40% of your maximum. And you still have another 60% left to give to yourself. So, you know, the next time you think, oh, I don't want to get off the couch and go to the gym, you still have another 60% left to give to yourself. Oh, I don't want to stay up late and finish that report or study for that test. You have another 60% left to give to yourself. I don't want to go to my kid's game. You have another 60% left to give to yourself. Remember that. When you think you're at the end of your row, you have another 60% left inside of you to make a difference in yourself and in the lives of other people. And keep on pushing for that. And keep on pushing for that. That's a powerful story. That's powerful right there. That's powerful. I learned and gleaned so much from you that I'm going to ask you to give the final comment, final statement, give you the last words for the day. And we'll just let those stand with everybody. And before you do it, I'll just say, everybody, thank you very much. It's been as powerful for you as it's been for me, or half as powerful. This has been one of the best. No, it was. I am going to ask Terry to come back because we have another whole area that we missed <laughs> we want to talk about. And that's your motivational checklist and those things surrounding that. So maybe I can get you back uh, in April to record and then we can get going that way again. But I give you the last word because I don't know. It's just great, great podcast. Can I tell you a, a final story then? Yeah, absolutely. You got it. So I've always been, first of all, thank you for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. I would love to come back and talk more with you about this. It's such a passion for me. And to engage with somebody like you, I really appreciate you having me on your show. So here's the story. When I was young, I've always been a big fan of Westerns growing up. My mom and dad would let me stay up late and watch Gunsmoke and Bonanza. My favorite was Wild <laughs> Wild West. And I know you're laughing because you, you remember. No, Gunsmoke was mine. Gunsmoke was my favorite. So. <laughs> yeah. 1993, the movie Tombstone came out. You may have mm. seen it. Huge blockbuster. It starred Val Kilmer as a man by the name of John Doc Holliday and Kurt Russell as a man by the name of Wyatt Earp. Now, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were two living, breathing human beings who walked yeah. on the face of the earth. They're not made up yeah. characters just for the movie. Exactly. Now, Doc was called Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but pretty much Doc Holliday was a gunslinger and a card shark. And Wyatt Earp had been some form of a lawman almost his entire adult life. So these two men from entirely opposite backgrounds somehow come together and form this very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, Doc Holliday is dying of tuberculosis at a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is about three hours from where you and I live. Real Doc Holliday died at that sanitarium and he's buried in the Glenwood Springs Cemetery. Wyatt at this point in his life is destitute. He has no money, he has no job, he has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to play cards with Doc and the two men pass the time that way. And in this almost last scene in the movie, the two men are talking about what they want out of life. 
And Doc says, when I was younger, I was in love with my cousin, but she joined a convent over the affair. But she's all that I ever want. And then he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt nonchalantly says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal. There's just life. And get on with living yours. Glenn, you and I probably know people. There's probably people out there listening to us that are sitting back and saying, when this happens, I'll have a normal life. Or when this happens or this occurs, I'll have a successful life. Or when this arises, I'll have a significant life. What I'd like to leave your listeners with is this. Don't wait. Don't wait for life to come to you. Get out there. Find the reason you were put on the face of this earth. Use your unique gifts and talents and live that reason. Because if you do, at the end of your life, I'm going to promise you two things. Number one, you're going to be a whole lot happier. And number two, you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart.